Welcome to the Primary Sources Podcast from Viral History. My name is Joanne Paul, and I am here to chat with some of the world's leading historians, not just about what they do, the stories they bring to life, but how they do it, and for goodness sake, why they do it. I'm interested in motivations and approaches, and how they came to find themselves buried in the past in the first place. Today, I am absolutely thrilled to welcome Professor Susanna Lipscomb to the podcast. Not only is Professor Lipscomb the author of numerous books on the early modern period, and we will touch on a great many of them today, she is also one of the most recognizable names and faces in the world of history broadcasting. Welcome, Susanna, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Joe. Though, if you call me Susanna one more time, I feel I feel like I'm being told off. So, <laughs> well, I just you know, I don't, would you prefer Professor Lipscomb then? Yes, I was hoping you were going to use my yeah. title throughout. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I'll just call you Prof. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you for being here. This is actually the second time we've chatted today. Um, I yes, think we're doing a sort of quid pro quo on podcasts today, aren't we? I think we're now allowed to talk about your podcast because you've just announced it today. Do you want to give it a bit of a plug while you're here? Yeah, sure. It's called Not Just the Tudors and it's from History Hit. And it is about what I like to think of as the long 16th century. So we go back well into well say 1492 or maybe before we go up to maybe 1692 I you know I'm, I'm I borrow generously from other centuries and we go around the world so we're thinking about things like Tokugawa Japan and the Songhai Empire and the Aztecs as well as thinking about the French wars of religion or perhaps a woman writing about the French wars of religion with perhaps. a certain Dr Joanne Paul <laughs> or we're thinking about uh, John Lilly, the queer Shakespeare, or dissolution of the monasteries. So it's not just the Tudors, but it's also very much the Tudors. So go and subscribe and listen to that, but not before you've listened to the rest of this podcast. Before we get to your wide ranging career, I want to be a dutiful historian and start at the beginning, if I can. Where did the love of history start for you? Was there a moment, a first memory of being really enamored by history? I had a teacher called Mrs. Marcus who allowed us to put stickers on our exercise books. So I think that maybe putting stickers of Elizabeth I and Henry VIII on exercise books was part of it. I grew up around the area where Nonsuch Palace was. Um, there is nothing really left of it, but lots of the roads are called after things like Amblin's Way. And, and I wonder if they... Uh, <laughs> Sublimal so seeds, yeah, subliminally yeah. programmed from an early age to be a Tudorist. Um, I tried to divert away from the course. I did some stuff on French history, but I was eventually just pulled back. Um, so that I have there's quite a rich family history as well. And I sometimes think that that has played part of it. The stories of, you know, the gene genealogies and the, and the stories that have come with, um, particularly down the Lipscomb line. Um, I don't really know. I had very good teachers. And I think ultimately that's what it comes down to is that you've got people who inspire you. When I was doing my A-levels with Alan Scadding and Roger Lane, they would they were just fabulous teachers. And, you know, they, Alan in particular was, feels really weird calling him that. Hello, sorry, Mr. Scadding. Um, preparing me for uh, university study and, you know, introducing me to books like E.H. Carr's What is History? And, at the time we were, I was working on the Russian Revolution with him and we were thinking about the, the newly opened Russian archives that could so that somebody like Will Koganov could produce a new biography of Lenin. And that really got me interested in that question. In fact, the question your podcast addressed, which is how we know what we know. And so I started thinking about the construction of history as an A-level student and that got me hooked. But I never planned to be a historian. I went to the history at university after a gap year in India and um, I wasn't just traveling, I was working. Uh, that sounded very sort of, you know, just laid around in India for a year. I did do a bit of that, but, um, uh, and then I actually planned to work in international development. That was the career path I had intended. And I learned um, a couple of languages whilst I was at university to that end and wanted my career to be based in India, but the, role that I was particularly interested in I came to believe was something that was better done by people indigenous to the country 
I sort of sort of um, intellectually talked myself out of a job and I didn't feel like fundraising or the sort of cons you know the UK based international development jobs were, were really for me and so in the end I became a historian really well I went to off to study my master's and doctorate which led to me becoming a historian really out for for want of anything else to do um and because I seemed you know to to be all right at it um so <laughs> that that's why I became a historian I mean I have to say I'm very similar to, to me as well I was going to go into politics and become a, a political aide but then just kept studying history because there were always more questions to answer I think um there was always a next step to uncover so you, but you are showing that you're actually but you are going back to politics I, I, so yeah. that you're showing that actually it is possible to do both these things I think that's something that that happens after you've sort of established yourself a little bit I'm not saying claiming that I've established myself um, but you start to have that freedom to return to things um, callings that you had sort of as as a young person are you returning to international development in any way I don't think they're crying out for me to be perfectly honest um, uh, so no I think in so far as I do that it will be through the gift of my money as opposed to my time although on Twitter you are fairly vocal about certain causes um, and use that as a platform yes I, I mean I still remain very very interested in, in in India and other countries and particularly care about well I mean I care about the treatment of people and the, the you know and I so uh, without trying to be too sort of worthy and make people not want to listen to me harping on about things. When something particularly provokes me, I do tend to speak about it. Returning to uh, your PhD, um, which you did at Oxford, and we'll come to the content of that, I think, um, in a few moments. Um, you then became curator at Hampton Court Palace. Was that as significant a leap as it sounds from PhD at Oxford to curator of Hampton Court? Well, there were other curators, so it wasn't a sole job. In fact, Lucy Worsley was the um, chief curator at the time, and still is, she has a job now with Tracy Borman. Um, and so I was one of 16 or 17 curators, I think. So I was a research curator. Yes, I got it just as I was finishing up my doctorate. And um, the position was through something called a knowledge transfer partnership, which was with Kingston University. And so it's a sort of a I thought of it as a postdoc, actually it quite often is a postgraduate uh, role um, that was a th for three years, part funded by the HRC, sorry, that's the, the Arts and Humanities Research Council um, and, and the university and, uh, and the business, in this case, Historic Royal Palaces. And the purpose of it was to bring somebody in to help work on the research behind marking the 500th anniversary of Henry VIII's succession. And I mean, I consider myself to have been really uh, fortunate to have got it. The, the job was obviously working earlier on the 16th century than I was working on at the time. And it was across the channel back and working on English history. And the irony was that I hadn't done my doctorate on 16th century England because I thought it was totally overstudied. And so I'd, I'd done 16th century France and here I was. <laughs> Um, and also Hampton Court was not far from where I grew up. Um, but because of that, I knew it and loved it. So yeah, I mean, it was an amazing job to get and it was a wonderful place to be. Uh, and I'm very grateful for everything I learned whilst I was there. Did you get more privileged direct access to the sources in that role? Well, there aren't really many sources at Hampton Court itself. Um, so just the sources that everybody else uses. Um, what I what I got is a sense of how to present history to the public. So I was working on exhibitions for the public, well, a, a temporary exhibition, but but mostly I was working on the the visitor interpretation, the, the a, a sort of what was called a permanent, which in heritage terms means about five years, um, permanent a, a new interpretation of the Tudor. Um, parts of Hampton Court and we accompanied that with a major I organized with Tom Betteridge um, Professor Tom Betteridge a major conference three-day international conference on um, Henry VIII um, I organized a series of talks with History Today the Henry VIII talks 
Um, we had a research advisory panel that we set up. And also I was doing things like writing painting labels, you know, so, and going from a hundred thousand word doctoral thesis to writing a 60 word painting label is an education because you have to learn how to be both concise and precise. Uh, and you have to think about the language that one uses. I remember when I was trying to write something about the Abraham tapestries, which are this is an amazing set of 10 tapestries um, some of which are always hanging in the Great Hall at Hampton Court and which show the story of Abraham, Genesis 12 to 24, and which Henry VIII had commissioned in the 1540s. So I wanted to talk about the covenant between Abraham and God. And as a curator, one works with a visitor interpreter, so someone who is choreographing the visitor experience. And one of the interpreters said to me, um, you can't use the word covenant because people might not know what it means. Uh, can you put contract? I said, well, a contract and a covenant are not the same thing. I can't put contract. Very different, very, very different idea. And so you have, but you know, you have to negotiate what you're going to put and what you're going to say. And so that was very, very useful to me. And it also made me aware of the fact that as a sort of career academic to that point, I had thought about going to a museum or going to a historic house as being an experience analogous to reading a book. But, it, but it's not. Like we all become more stupid when we're standing up basically. And we don't want to read as much as we do when we're sat in an armchair. Um, although as I get older, when I'm sat in an armchair, I also just sort of want to drink wine and watch TV. But the, the other thing is that when you arrive at a historic house, the two things on most people's minds are wheeze and teas. Like, where are the loos and where do I get a, a cuppa? And but you've got to cater to what a visitor experience really is. Anyway, so it, just, it was just in such an education for me in terms of stretching between my academic um, grounding and reaching out to the visitor. And I'll tell you something that Lucy Wellesley said to me. Lucy said something that was so infuriating at the time. But I, I asked her, you know, I was preparing something on the Reformation and I was preparing something on courtiers and all the, doing all this research. And I said, you know, how should I, how should I prepare? Should I write up a research report? You know, what should this look like? And she, she said, no, you just need to become a walking encyclopedia. I said, what? How can I measure that? How can I tell when I have succeeded? Um, you know, what, what does that mean? But actually she was right. So that when anyone came along a state department warder or one of the interpreters, if they had a question to ask, what did the collar of a smock look like in 1540? I could be like, well, actually, this is what, you know, so you just sort of needed to know a bunch of stuff that, that actually as a historian, um, I hadn't up until that point necessarily thought about. Well, and we don't, I think, or at least my training wasn't about memorizing things. It was being able to read information, consolidate information, maybe think critically about information and then reproduce it, but not actually to memorize it. I, you know, I think my supervisor, um, Professor Quentin Skinner is a walking encyclopedia. He, he knows stuff, but I, I at least never really felt that I had to do that because there's so much information at my fingertips um, and there's so much information that I can learn and then put into smaller notes. I don't actually, uh, yeah, I, I don't retain information in, in that way. But has that been a really useful skill for you going forward? Yes, and actually I'm reflecting on something that um, my sometime friend and colleague Dan Jones uh, has written about this recently for a book I'm editing or have edited with Helen Carr called What is History Now? It's coming out in September. And one of the things he says in that is about how Actually, if you're going to write something well, he's writing narrative history for, you know, best selling narrative history for a popular audience. You need to know it inside out. You need to be able to sit down in a pub with a friend, if that is allowed under COVID regulations, and speak for 20 minutes or more without notes, without losing your flow about something. Only when you know it that well can you write about it in a way that makes it work for narrative. And that's really interesting that you have to internalize it if you're going to spew it out in a different way. 
Your book that emerged out of your time at Hampton Court Palace was 1536, the year that changed Henry VIII. How did the angle of this book, understanding Henry VIII through this horrible year he had, and I'm suddenly really realizing that we can relate to this having lived through 2020, how did this idea for uh, a new angle really on Henry VIII occur to you? I should just wait for our clock to finish making noise. Um, so one of the things I was asked to do in these series of exercises that we were doing over 2007, 2008 to prepare for this new interpretation, new visitor experience was I was asked to come up with a list of you know, 10 important moments, crucial moments in Henry VIII's life. And I did that and then realized a lot of them were in the same year. And that felt very interesting because, of course, whilst there were biographies of Henry VIII, there are many more now because more were brought out in 2009. Lucy Woodings, for example, is, is, is one of the best. J.J. Scarrod's book's biography existed, and so there were these narrative histories, but a lot of the analysis of Henry VIII had been done in a kind of thematic way. So we'll think about his Reformation or we'll, you know, whatever, whatever it is. And actually putting these events back to back in this way and thinking about what it would have been like to live through that series of horrors and the cumulative effect that must have had on his personality seemed to me suddenly really important and I it seemed amazing to me that it hadn't been done so I did this kind of slice of life biography but it seemed to me that that year contained all the ingredients necessary to catalyze this change that we see in Henry VIII from being this gorgeous young prince to becoming this obese and ruthless tyrant and I'm pretty sure he is a tyrant um, by both 16th century and modern definitions by, by the end of his reign and so that's what came out of it and uh, you know I had again it's like it was extraordinary because of course I ended up publishing on Henry VIII before I ever published on my work apart from journal articles on France and I didn't publish my book on France so much much later um, and it was fun. It was fun to learn to write that way. And uh, I might be recording a, an audio book of it soon. It'll be interesting to see how it stands up because of course I haven't gone back and read it for quite a while, but there we go. Do you ever reread your own work later on? Mainly when I'm trying to remember things. So um, I don't know if people know this about authors, but you know, we forget what we've written. So I sometimes have to go back and be like, I n I'm, I'm sure I'm <laughs> I'm sure I knew something at some point about that. Um, so I get so, but you know, I wouldn't sit down and read one for pleasure. I think mean, that would not be a pleasure. No, it's an odd experience because you definitely have, or at least I, I'll speak for myself. I definitely have moments where I go, "Ooh, why did I write that?" But then I also have moments of going, "Oh, that's that's an all right turn of phrase, isn't it? That's that's am I sure it's not bad?" bad. Yeah. <laughs> Thinking about your work more generally, um, certainly 1536 and also your book, The King is Dead, which is on Henry VIII's will, are technically trade books for a sort of wider, more popular audience, but they both make contributions to academic scholarly discussions. I use The King is Dead on my, you know, in my uh, academic monograph. There are, there is this idea, I think, that um, trade books don't do that, that they don't articulate new arguments, that they don't bring new sources to light, that they don't engage in these academic discussions. Are you trying to do something different with your work to make sure that those trade books do engage with that? Or is there maybe a misunderstanding uh, about the genre? And actually, there's a greater overlap between academic and public history than a lot of people think. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, it's, basically, it's basically bollocks. Um, I think that the that like there can be good academic books and bad academic books. There can be good trade books and good and bad trade books. And I think that a book that's intended for a general audience doesn't have to shed its scholarship at the cover. You know, I think it should be absolutely as rich in scholarship as an academic book. It wears it differently. It presents it differently. And often in perhaps a more accessible way. But I feel that there is absolutely no divide between good scholarship and good writing. There shouldn't be anyway. 
it's certainly true that not all trade books do that, but that doesn't mean that it's not achievable. Let's finally come to Voices of Neem, um, which was the result of uh, your PhD work as well as um, work that you did um, subsequent to that. And it was published by an academic press, but of course had a wider readership as well. Once again, um, blurring those, those perhaps artificial lines. For those who uh, perhaps uh, had come to see you as the authority on Henry VIII and his court, it, it might seem like a departure. Did it feel like a departure to you? Did it feel like something very, very different? Well, I suppose it is very different in terms of, although it's the same century largely, the material I looked at in France is between 1560 and 1615. It's looking at a different strata of society. So it's looking at very ordinary women and it's using sources that allow us to access those ordinary women's lives, which are fascinating. Um, so at the outs from the outside, I can see that it looks very different. And although it was the trade wing of an academic press, it still looks like a you know, more academic book. But I suppose the questions that animate my research are similar. So I'm interested in people. I'm interested in what motivated them, why they did what they did. Um, I'm interested in, you know, what we could broadly call sort of psychological, religious, gender history, social history, all these sort of things. And those are approaches that I've brought to both working on Henry VIII and working on ordinary women in 16th century France. And I'm interested in interrogating what the sources we use have tell us and what they cannot tell us and the limits of those and where legitimately our imagination should be used. Um, so I suppose I'm always interested in trying to give people a hearing in the past. Why it's a sort of sense of doing justice. I had a really strong sense when I was writing that book of wanting to make their voices sing and you know let these women's stories be told, be heard after the, all these hundreds of years. And I'd say the tr same is true in the book I'm working on now, which is about six far more famous women. Um, which which all, six would those be? <laughs> well, they all have in common that they were married to a, a not a very nice man. Um, well, he starts quite nice, actually. It just doesn't get so nice later on. Anyway, so Henry VIII's queens, and yet, even those famous women, I feel that there is a story to be told, of their voice to be heard, and there's more to be done in excavating that. So it's been really interesting. I'm really pleased, actually, that I haven't had a career that's been confined to either of these. And that, because I feel like there's so much I've learned from doing the other in terms of when I'm writing about one of the other topics. And I hope to move on and do all sorts of things. Can you tell us a little bit about the sources you used in Voices of Neem, which allowed you to recover these voices? Yes, so they are these records of something called the consistory. So the background to this is that in the south of France, people converted to Protestantism in the 1550s, 1560s, it became legal to do so in the 1560s and thereafter. And where the Protestants established strength they set up uh, a consistory in each town, which was a kind of moral tribunal. It was a kind of governing body of the church. It was also the, for the distribution of poor relief. But it's the moral bit that I was particularly interested in, and indeed they were particularly interested in. And so they kept these fabulous records, manuscripts that you can find sort of um, on parchment, bound in leather in archives around France and in Paris. Um, that hold of all of the cases of moral failings they'd come across and they called in the people responsible, they reprimanded them, they interrogated them and they asked for their response. And then also we have the deliberations and conclusions as well. And because the 16th century particularly held women to be guilty when it came to sin, far more easily tempted to sin than men, much weaker. Um, when you're looking into morals, you're really looking into women. And so it 
created a space in which women's voices were heard and recorded. Women who couldn't read or write, for the most part, nearly all of them, who wouldn't otherwise have left any records to posterity. And of course, these are being written down by a male scribe and they are, you know, go through that prism. And I, I think they're mostly being spoken in French. Occasionally they're being spoken in Occitan. The records are in French and occasional references to Occitan words, which is the language of the, the south of France. Um, but French is spread quite widely, widely over the south of France by that point. But they're being translated from the third person, from the first person into the third person at least. So there is a sort of mediation process. We're hearing them at some distance. Um, but contrary to some historians who say you can never access the voices of these people, I'd say, well, yeah, I'm sure that caveat, 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 but you, but kind of you can. And um, that that gives us such fascinating insight into these ordinary women's stories and the stories of course are all about moments of social breakdown so they're about things when things went wrong um someone's been raped there's a, a pregnancy outside of wedlock um these two people have had a quarrel this woman has been gossiped about and so they're fascinating for those crisis moments of women's lives do you have a particular favorite moment or story Oh my goodness, you could be here all day. I have so many. Um, where do I start? I mean, so uh, I have been particularly interested in a story of a woman known as La Gascon. Um, Jeanne Gossier is her, her real name. And this is an interesting example because uh, Jeanne doesn't actually testify before the consistory herself. Now, normally one of the reasons why we have women's words is because unlike criminal courts at the time um, where women's testimony is disregarded and doesn't bear that much weight and they can't testify and once they're married and that sort of thing um, the consistory writes women's words down but this actually we get through other people so we get six witnesses including her close friend Astrid Ganzo who um, comes and tells the story of what's happened to Jeanne and essentially Jeanne has uh, circumstantial evidence suggests being raped by her employer's father-in-law. Um, and she's in, she was from a nearby, she was from Gascony and she had been moved into the town of Montauban in the south of France as a servant girl. And um, she would therefore have been somewhere in her teens or twenties, because this is an age of life cycle service that people serve until they've saved off enough money to marry, which tends to be in their kind of mid to late twenties. And her assailant is 60 years old. And I happen to know his age because he appears in a register of criminal sentences. He's mentioned twice in association with other women um, on counts of paillardise, which is the French word, which it comes from pi, meaning hay or straw. So it almost literally means rolling in the hay. It means sexual sin or, you know, sex outside of marriage, fornication. But in those criminal sentences, the women had been convicted and punished. And he's just mentioned in passing and has no punishment. That's the civil authorities. And so in the same year, all of these cases are in 1595. And then Jan gets pregnant, um, leaves her employer's house in disgrace, goes to a nearby village where she has a child and she sends a couple into Montebon to have the child baptized in the faith of its father. And that's how the case comes to the consistory's attention. Rumor meanwhile has been making it clear probably from Jeanne herself who the father is. And so they, they sort of swing into action because they do act on rumors. And so they, in, talk to her employer, they talked to um, a, a medic who had gone to see her when she was asking for something to abort the child, basically. They say to, to bring on her flowers, to bring on her period. Um, they talked to her dear friend that she'd gone to stay with afterwards. And this is where it gets really interesting because her friend Astro relates that Jeanne had gone to stay with her when she was about seven months pregnant. So she, and before this point, she's clearly sort of ignored it and hoped that it would go away or something um and she um so she's got some medicine with her which the, the surgeon swears isn't from home but who knows that 
that she was going to take that would um, purge her liver. And Astrid is like, how can you, she says this one, she says, Jeanne Arre, which is the word you use to stop cattle, stop. Um, how can you say that you're not pregnant? And um, and at this moment, runs her hand over her friend's tummy and, and, and breasts um, and her, and at this moment, Jeanne admits that she is and sort of confesses and says that the father is this Pierre Del Host, her uh, employer's father-in-law. Um, and she feels so wretched and in despair that she um, wants to kill herself and she carries this knife with her and she plans to do so. And, and Astrog talks her down. But you, you know, amazing insight into this actually terribly common situation where this woman who was employed as a servant is, you know, therefore one of the most uninfluential people in society, um, who is away from her family and her kinship groups. Because she's called La Gascon, we know that she's speaking uh, a, a dialect of Occitan that isn't a local one, um, and and so on and so on. So she and she's young, etc. And this is awful, you know, being pregnant outside of marriage at this time is so shameful. It means that she's going to lose her work, um, her employment, you know, the, the, her livelihood. And yet that's not the end of the story because evidently she finds some way to have uh, recorded that Pierre Delhost is the one that fought. And so the consistory call him in and interrogate him. And he admits with this sort of devastating insouciance that yes, he's the father, and um, but won't say sorry for it, won't repent. And so they uh, prevent him from taking the sacrament, which might seem like you're like, where's the whipping? Where's the punishment? But in the South of France in the 16th century for the Protestants, not going to take the Eucharist at the time that everyone did is this massive dishonor. And I think that in recent years, when I first started working on this, people thought that these shaming punishments were kind of, you know, uh, really lacking muscle and not impressive at all. But I think now in the age of social media, we realize the effect that shaming can have on a person and how it can make them crumble. And, um, I've got a previous case of a man who'd committed adultery where the consistory have said to him that he can't take the Eucharist. And he says um, that they're being too severe on him and um, that he you know, would rather he were dead. Now, we don't have to take that at face value, but it gives you some sense. I think it, these things mattered. And so Jeanne never appears before the consistory, but, the, the, but Pierre de Host, as a Protestant, is called up and called to account because of what she goes on to say. The detail of that is fantastic. Um, the, 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 you can feel the moment of, of her speaking to her friend and, and the emotion of that. Do you feel that these sources have been overlooked? Have, has their value not been fully recognized? Yeah, I mean, they've totally been overlooked. I mean, so before I used them, I'd, at most a handful of other scholars, I'd probably say maybe two, two or three had read them. Um, there's a, a French scholar called Philippe Charrière who prepared this grand French thesis, sort of a magnum opus um, on the ecclesiastical discipline of the Protestant church in Nîmes, which is where many of the sources come from. And it's an amazing piece of work, but he wasn't particularly interested in asking about women um, or interested in people's women's lives. And actually, also, and so, whereas uh, Graham Murdoch has used them to write a bit more about women and Raymond Mentz has used them. So there are a few other historians who've used them, but when I came to it, people were still saying, you know, as a, a leading French historian on this, who says, this is not the place to talk about women or family, that the, the consistories were a place where you, you use them to talk about ecclesiastical instruction and the, the operations of the church. And, you know, you don't use them, you don't mind them for that. Um, and then the other thing, actually, the other thing pushing against, even when I was preparing my book, so I sort of had an earlier stab at preparing my book and then put it aside and did some other things. And that earlier stab, um, you know, I did a proposal and got some feedback from readers. And the the readers sort of said, oh, you know, feel like you're letting the narrative drive the analysis rather than the other way around. So like, there was too much detail of the stories, basically, and we just need to focus on what we learn from them. Um, you know, not so much stuff on the on on the stories, 
and I just really felt like it was going against what I wanted to do, which was like, yeah, sure. I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm all down with the analysis. I'm going to think about what these things mean and I'm going to derive. And there's all sorts of, you know, my overall conclusions really is that women were a lot more powerful than we've given them credence. Um, but uh, I absolutely wanted to make the stories come out and I wanted to give them space to breathe. And I wanted to tell them at a length that hadn't ever been told. So yeah, so they'd certainly been overlooked. It's interesting when we spoke to um, Hallie Rubenhold, we were talking about social history and um, what an amazing job she's done, of course, in the five and elsewhere, recovering voices of, of um, women in particular um, who don't come from the upper classes, who have been ignored from history, um, who are often um, also servants um, or sex workers. And, and she had been told, and she remembers being told um, that you just can't do social history to any great detail, that you can't recover these people's stories, that the sources just don't exist as they do for kings and dukes and queens and everyone else. Um, she swore, <laughs> she, um, this is the one bit of profanity we have on the podcast so far. Um, and, and you haven't asked Dan Jones on yet, then I take no, it. No, no, no. Next, next season. Yeah. Um, but now, you know, you can, you can swear as well. Um, but you know, that it's, that it's, it's all a bunch of bullshit that, that those sources do exist. We just don't think of them or we don't use them creatively enough or, um, we're using them for the wrong things. Would, would, would you agree with that assessment that, that social history has a lot more, there are a lot more sources for social history than we've recognized? So I would say yes, and I would say no. So the, there's, the no bit is to say that um, one of the things that historians who work on post-colonial studies and subaltern studies and things like that have recognized over the last few years is that the archive is a site of power. So there is an extent to which the stories that we have are those that have been allowed to remain by those in power that support the narratives of those in power and justify their power. Um, so they tend not to be the stories of the powerless or those who were illiterate or those who couldn't, you know, keep, have some record kept of their lives. So for example, if you come to study the thousands of black, women transported across the Atlantic uh, in, and then enslaved, we don't have sources that give us their voices, really. They were not granted opportunities to write if they, say, turned up in um, the British Car Caribbean, then they were not able under law to give testimony they were not educated to read and write in their new language. The only glimpses that we have of them are in these awful moments of violence generally. So that's my caveat that there are people who will always remain hidden to an extent that we can only, we can, I mean, even having said that, I've, Marissa Fuentes has written an amazing book called Dispossessed Lived, which tries to do something even with those fragments those archival fragments um, looking at women's lives who were enslaved. But there are things we'll never know. But at the same time, Hallie is also right that there are many more sources that can allow us into this if we only read them that way. If we look at them in that light, if we ask those questions of those sources and that you can dig around and you can find things. I mean, so she's found in, this evidence about the five victims of Jack the Ripper. And it is possible to do that, you know, in the 19th century has those riches. And, you know, I've found these cases in the end, actually over a thousand of them, although to differing degrees for each woman, how much we've got that allow us into the lives of 16th and 17th century women. So it is possible for some women, but that there will still be billions who existed, who have left not a trace. You've spoken recently about um, the role that fiction can play in, in recovering um, those, those gaps to history. What can fiction do for us? 
Well, this leads on very nicely, actually, because one of the scholars exploring this uh, is uh, Professor Sadia Hartman, who wrote a book, came out a couple of years ago, called Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments, which looks at, at the lives of um, women in American cities between 1885 and 1925, during which time young black women could be arrested for not just for moral depravity, but on suspicion of being morally depraved. So that meant if they were out late at night, if they had serial relationships, um, if they were suspected of those things, they could be arrested and put into state penitentiaries as sort of reforming reformatories. And so here we go, come again to the question of the archives being a place of power because the archives of those um, reformatories give a certain version of those women as having wayward lives. And um, Professor Hartman's assertion is that actually maybe what we see here is beautiful experiments that these women are living experimental lives. And so she has done something which she refers to in lots of different ways. One, at one point she calls it critical fabulation. Um, so from fabula in Latin, the kind of the fable, the um, but with a critical and, and apparatus uh, or else she calls it close narration you know and basically importing techniques from fiction to allow us to think about questions that can't be answered by the sources so it's a very fine line I mean how one works with these things how one writes in a way that fictionalizes or at least is fictive without fictionalizing maybe that's the line um, and I don't really have the answers yet, but I think there may be some roles that quest empathetic questions can have there or, um, you know, just, I think all historians use their imagination and I think that we could be honest about when we're doing that. So I, yeah, I'm wrestling with that. But, but of course, if, you, if you're asking it in a more straightforward way, we can look at something like Magri or Farrow's Hamnet or, um, Hilary Mantel's Wolf Hall or you know all these many amazing works of historical fiction about the period that we work on and often they do have a prerogative as a novelist to go into areas as a historian that we we dare not go into so I think that history can recreate sorry I think that fiction can recreate aspects of history for us as long as they're tethered to the sources I'm going to go into our quick fire round now um, before ending on <laughs> the three questions that I'm asking all of our guests. Um, I, I will ask you to answer these fairly quickly, um, but of course you can provide an explanation. Who would you rather have a meal with, Anne Boleyn or Anne of Cleves? Yeah. Anne of Cleves is probably much nicer, but I'd, Anne of Boleyn is such a mystery. I'm going to be so controversial already. and choose Cleves. I've choose Cleves. Why? Because she was lovely and <laughs> intelligent and um, clever. And I think she would make a good companion. Where would you rather be right now? A French archive or a French wine bar? You know me well. Um, <laughs> that it's is possible we've been friends for a few years yeah <laughs> really I'd rather go to a French archive and then go straight to a French wine bar um, so given that it's like quarter, half three I guess the French archive but with plans later very soon to head towards the French wine bar you are gifted a time machine what year do you set the dial to 1536 Fair enough, that, I shouldn't have even asked that question. Um, what is the most ridiculous thing you've ever done in the name of history? I put on woolen clothes and went into a pool, pond to investigate Tudor drowning. I was hoping that was the one. I, I thought it might be that one. Remind us too, what, what, what time of year it was when you did that, how cold it was outside. <laughs> Actually, amazingly, I think it was something like now it's sort of April May time, but it was one one of those cold snaps. So the, my God, it was cold. It was really cold. I I, I can't imagine what it would have been like if we'd done it in January or February. And uh, I was yeah, I was blue. But it's one of those. Ins I mean, the other competing one, of course, is for the same series, um, running up and downstairs in in a 
corset to see if I uh, could breathe. Um, and I really had a moment when I was doing that when I thought, I'm going to, I'm going to faint. I'm going to faint and I'm going to fall down these stairs and they're just going to keep filming. And this was for, um, uh, was it hidden, hidden dangers? Hid, hid, uh, just say the word. They're just going to keep filming. It was for hidden killers of the home. So Victorian home for the running up and down and Tudor home for the drowning. And so I particularly you know, a sadistic director, I think. I was and, just going to uh, say, in order to prove that there were hidden killers, they, they basically tried to kill you. <laughs> You've spotted it. Yes. <laughs> All right. And now for three questions that I'm asking every one of our guests. Um, these don't have to be quick fire, um, so you can take your time. What is your favorite primary source that you have worked on? Well, I suppose it would have to be one of the sets of consistorial records. what the listener may not know, but is about to, is that Joe and I once took a holiday in the south of France. And Joe was mostly on holiday and I was mostly in the archives. Mm -hmm. We had some other people with us. And um, one day, Joe came with me to the archives and helped me taking photographs of the source I wanted to take home. So you've seen these things, you know how amazing they are. And so I think one of those manuscripts has become so important to me, probably let's say, I think I'd probably pick the uh, register from 1578 to 1583 has been such an important record for me in terms of bringing out women's stories. I remember that day in the archive. Um, it, was, it's a, it was a beautiful archive, um, very modern um, and very bright. I'm used to working in the, the manuscripts room of the British Library. Um, and uh, yes, very proud to say that my thumb is in some of the photos of those manuscripts that you worked on. You are immortalized yes. with your thumb. <laughs> what are you working on next? I think you gave us a bit of a clue earlier. Well, so I am working on my podcast, not just the Tudors, which you've already kindly bigged up. I'm also working on a series for Channel 5, which is... Um, called something like Walking Tudor England uh, the channel may change the title nearer the time um, and I am working on a book about the women married to Henry VIII um, the six um, the sequel to Halley's the five um, <laughs> so that should be that will be coming out god willing uh, late 2022 gonna have to figure out who the seven are <laughs> the secret <laughs> we'll figure it out eventually. what advice would you give to a historian just starting out well I do think that well I would say this she would say this wouldn't she I do think that thinking about who you're speaking to is really important and I do think that it's okay to engage with the public and that <laughs> More than okay, I think it's actually our duty as historians to do that. And so some of that is thinking about how one writes. So I, I would urge you to read uh, George Orwell's Politics in the English Language and think about clear writing that doesn't get too high polluting. Um, and I would encourage you to read lots because it's all about reading widely and not just about your own period either about other periods because there's so many riches out there and not just history either because then you can get a different sense of of writing and also write 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 um from as much as you can because uh, you've got a lot of words to get out of you before you start writing well <laughs> Thank you so much, Susie, uh, Professor Lipscomb, uh, for taking the time to speak to us and uh, sharing your journey through history with us. Thank you, Joe. Just a reminder, if you want to hear more conversations with history makers like Professor Susanna Lipscomb, do subscribe to Primary Sources podcast and follow us and Viral History on Instagram and Twitter, where you can also suggest future guests and send along quickfire questions to grill them with. Thanks for listening to Primary Sources. Bye.